welcome everyone, dear educational planners and, and managers, colleagues, development partners, IAP alumnus, and all dear friends. I'm Suzanne Grant Lewis, the director of UNESCO's International Institute for Educational Planning, IIEP. Welcome to the first meetup on geospatial data and educational planning. Educational planning processes are inherently spatial with questions like, where do you build schools? Where do you deploy teachers? How do you efficiently distribute teaching and learning materials? How do you organize inspection routes? So today, our colleague, Emily Gagnon, who's leading IIP's development unit here in Paris, will introduce you to her team and the work that we've been doing to try to increase the breadth and the depth of the use of spatial data in educational planning. You'll also get to meet our technical partners, and I want to say thank you very much for your collaboration. This meeting is probably not like any other you've, that uh, we've been organizing recently. It's in the development unit's DNA, if you will, to try to experiment, test, collaborate, and, and develop prototypes. So that's why this event is taking place today. We want you to react, to engage, advocate, request, have a dialogue with us, because together we can harness the power of geospatial data in our practices. I'm looking forward to the outcomes of the session so that we can together contribute to planning education systems which are more efficient, more equitable, and higher quality. Thank you again for being with us. Over to you, Emily. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, as you said, it's, it's really a pleasure to, to meet uh, this community that we're creating today. Uh, in, 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 effectively, we have probably half of the audience that is from planning departments, manager of education, and the other half that are more technical people, GIS specialists, people from the uh, more technological side. And so it's really nice to see you all here. Uh, as Sue mentioned, I'm Amélie Gagnon, and I'm leading the development unit at IIEP in Paris. And this unit is relatively new, and we do a lot of things. You might have heard also about one tool that we developed, uh, the policy toolbox. But this meeting really is about telling you uh, more uh, of what we do and how we do it for using geospatial data in educational planning. So we are a very small team. Uh, I work uh, with Herman Vergas Mesa uh, as, a, as a staff. And also we have two interns right now contributing to the work, uh, Lily Vassero from HSC Paris and Sciences Po and Michael Pabanilla uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. Our objective in the unit really is to uh, improve efficiency of educational planning processes with brief to the point technical tools and methodologies. And this is unique because we also serve as a kind of foresight forum and lab for experimenting ideas. And we try to work as much as possible across teams and offices so we can really brainstorm and, and build on the experience and knowledge of the different uh, staff uh, profiles. We explore with varied sources of data. We explore different techniques. And we like to engage with traditional and also non-traditional partners in and outside of the education sector. We want our tools to be available to everybody, to all, so everything that you will ever see coming out of this team will be based on free, open source, uh, free of access and free uh, of charge, uh, and open source software as much as we can. We provide both documentation and code, so everything can be replicated. Mapping is not new, so mentioned it. Uh, there is location and space as a component everywhere. But our work on geospatial data and educational planning goes well beyond maps and dashboards. We want to, we are tackling topics such as correlations between context variables and education system variables. We look into travel optimization, deep learning methods, natural language processing, and the likes. We are building on three elements. First, ministry staff use computers every day, and there are computers available in ministries of education. And these computers have a large processing capacity, and there is an incredible amount of geospatial data there available that is either nationally produced or made available in uh, open access format. And so our work is based on the assumption that evidence is multiple, and using geospatial data into analysis, planning, diagnosis can better inform decision making. So for today, what we have prepared is an overview of different projects 
and activities that we are uh, producing that are either ready for publication or for piloting. We will go in a deeper dive into three specific projects, uh, dear to our hearts, let's say, uh, that uh, we developed with uh, specific development uh, technical partners. I will present briefly the results of our recent hackathon, and then uh, we have a forum space, a, a, a moment for exchanging questions, ideas, and inviting each other for collaboration. So I will uh, give the floor to Herman so he can share with you a brief overview, like a bit uh, in succession, successively, uh, relatively fast, uh, on six tools and activities that we are leading. So flowcharts uh, for school mapping, automatized atlas and reports, uh, estimating local school age populations, geographically weighted regressions, and then some background papers that we're exploring right now and our training uh, offer. Thank you, Herman. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to go very briefly over these different projects and tools that we're developing, the first of which relates to school mapping. And so basically, uh, knowing the location of schools is not a given for many countries. And even some countries that currently know the location of the some of the schools don't have a full picture of what the school system looks like. And so one of the first tools that we provide Is, um, a flow chart. Nous offrons, c'est un diagramme technique qui nous permet de travailler avec les gouvernements pour cartographier l'ensemble des écoles et les placer sur des cartes dans le pays. Et ceci permet une analyse. Location of schools. This, this mapping is fundamental in extracting value out of geospatial analysis. Uh, so as part of technical cooperation projects uh, for countries who have none or partial education systems, We try to cater for different systems with different levels of, advan of advancement and different structures in their educational uh, system. Um, we are in a position where we can make custom made processes according to the country needs. And uh, we go from school uh, countries that have no information at all on the location of the schools to countries that have some location but might need help uh, reaching those Uh, remote locations with techniques such as uh, remote sensing. Um, then going forward, we have the possibility or uh, a technical note on how to make atlases and reports. And so basically this is something that ministries of education have been working on for, for years and years. And these are very technical reports that are really high quality data reach statistical yearbooks. But uh, in some cases, there might be bottlenecks in how to transform all the raw data from the education management information systems that governments have into actionable reports that can be used at the central and at the local level to make policy decisions. And so one of the things that we do is we provide a technical note that allows users from ministries and from local secretariats to use open source software such as QGIS to perform and automate tasks such as the creation of atlases and reports. Um, then we have the, the estimation of local school age populations. So basically, um, even though countries might have the idea of how many people there are by age for large administrative units. When it comes to local small administrative units, countries usually don't have this aggregated data on a single year basis. And so what we do is together with our partners... Donc, ce que nous faisons, c'est qu'avec nos partenaires et nos amis... With raster data, which is basically images that are uh, located in space where one pixel equals to how many people of a specific age group live in one place. And we apply a method called Sprague multipliers, which basically allows us to disaggregate this into single years of age so that each government for any level of administrative unit, even the very, very, very small ones, can then reconstruct school age populations so that they can use this to create certain educational indicators. Um, we also have um, the possibility of 
Yeah, next slide, Excuse please. Me, please. <laughs> um, we also have the possibility of learning using geographically weighted regressions uh, how contextual and educational variables interact and change those interactions across space. So basically, in traditional um, regression literature, you only have, for a, a specific data set, you only have one uh, regression coefficient for each uh, variable, but for a whole country or for a whole region. And what this methodology allows us to do is we can have, for each variable, we can have a map of interactions between that variable, which is an explanatory variable, and what we're trying to explain, so that we can see more than how, um, what policies to implement, where to implement them. So this way we can know better how certain variables interact with educational variables. And so we, we can pinpoint the locations where it's more cost effective to apply certain policies because we know how in space they interact with each other. And of course, this is all built on open source data and open source methodologies, which of course are totally accessible to anyone with codes and explanatory notes. Um, moving along, we have the background papers. And so basically uh, these are two papers that we're building, the first on ethics and the second on different communication methods. So ethics uh, and the use of geospatial data will work on finding a balance between the precisions and the precision and the accuracy of data on one hand, with the added value that it adds to educational planning and management and the privacy of the data that we're working with, especially because we're working either with people of concern or with underage students. And so we always need to keep in mind this balance between how deep can we go in the data and how, how can we preserve the privacy of these individuals. And then the second, um, the second element, which is, how can we map the existing communication methods? So radio, TV, internet access, so that we can assess the connectivity of the educational system. Um, and to see, for instance, with the COVID crisis, but also to access remote areas where it's really hard to deliver education, how can we take advantage of these different communication methods to further expand the offer from a Ministry of Education? And then lastly, um, we have, um, of course, our training offer. Um, this training offer has different components. We have self-paced uh, training manuals on how to use QGIS, which is an open source mapping uh, software that we use for all the uh, spatial analysis that we perform, um, that has follow along examples, that uses available data, and that allows anyone from anywhere to do um, the training, even without having to have internet uh, while doing it. Uh, we also have QGIS modules embedded in our specialized SCP training courses on school mapping and microplanning. Um, and naturally, these courses are also not only for um, people and, and, and colleagues working in ministries of education and development partners, but also in-house so that we can further advance the capabilities and the techniques that colleagues within IIP can apply for their educational analysis. And then finally, of course, we have customized trainings. Uh, so this means that any agency, any government can ask for a specific training on a specific element. And that can, of course, be tailored into a package that caters to the needs of that ministry or of that agency to go over any of the different methodologies that we have developed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Haman. Um, before we move to the next section, I, I just want to add that all these tools, methodologies, or approaches and projects that we, we were working on, we are working on, are, are based on easily accessible information. Uh, you mentioned the, the statistical software, QGIS, the Python, uh, the Jupyter notebooks, and so forth. Uh, but Jack is asking a very good question on, on, on the, um, the Q&A so that I can already mention that 
we're working with information that is publicly available, but the the whole purpose of all this is that uh, national officers can can work with national data. So the, the the example that I want to give is on the uh, population estimates uh, at the local level. Um, this 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 is Bangladesh, so a part, <laughs> and a, a percent people in the attendance will uh, will be able to to recognize their their country, but. Even at national level, with nationally public, pu published uh, population estimates, uh, sometimes it's really difficult for educational planner in uh, in local education offices to have a clear view of their uh, school age population. And so, in that sense, using national nationally pub published uh, estimates, uh, using nationally and politically agreed population estimates uh, by by five year. Uh, age brackets uh, can absolutely be used with our methodology, regardless the source of population data, for example, you could use this methodology, regardless the source of geospatial information uh, on different uh, variables, you could use the geographically weighted regressions. And so our methodologies are uh, absolutely uh, conform to the concept of a methodology, right? It's an approach. We provide the code that we use to, to do this. Um, but it's totally uh, customizable to uh, nationally available resources, politically agreed uh, resources. And so there is absolutely no um, uh, obstacle for, for colleagues to use this in their national context. We will talk afterwards a bit about how to engage and how to use these tools uh, together. Um, and so, uh, but now I, I, we will move into a section where we take a deeper dive on three of our favorite tools. And I, I wrote favorite tools and I thought, oh, this is like, I guess, choosing between your children because everything is so interesting and everything is so uh, full of potential. You, you don't want to, to make a selection. But these, these tools that we're going to present are, are quite special because uh, they tackle core topics uh, of our trade, education supply, educational quality, uh, and they are we, we did these tools with uh, par, uh, key players in their field, so GISPO and UNOSAT, that I will introduce in a minute. And it's based on a real, real, true collaborative partnership. So we exchanged ideas, we uh, explained what we had in mind, and we developed these tools. Nous okay. avons élaboré ces outils ensemble. GISPO, beaucoup d'entre vous les connaissent. C'est une société de consultants en Finlande qui sont très actives dans certains domaines, dans différents forums. And, uh, they, they, we have in common that they share a vision on, on using geospatial data and open source tools to solve educational planning challenges. And so we work with Topi Chukanov, Santu Pukonen, and Pekka Sarkola. And uh, we are grateful to have them with us today. And UNOSAT is the operational satellite application program of the UN based at UNITAR. Uh, and we work with colleagues in uh, Bangkok and Geneva. So Aisha Sheldon is with us today, Anua Chitsaikan, uh, and Olivier Van Damme. And we also recognize the contributions of uh, Khaled Mashri that we worked with uh, in the beginning. And so uh, what we'll go through now is uh, first uh, a tool on uh, using isochrons for catchment areas. Another one on analyzing suitability and risk uh, for educational facilities. And another piece that is a, a bit unusual, but it's really about how can we rethink inspection circuits if we were to design inspection services from scratch. So in educational planning, a key concept is catchment areas, but we are, uh, our understanding or assumption, I guess, is that children that need to walk 15 minutes to school in the morning, have a very different learning experience than those who walk 60, 90, 120 minutes to get to school. And so with our approach, this methodology can estimate the time that every learner takes to walk from home to school. And because we, by using our tool on population estimates, we can, we can evaluate also the proportion of the school age population from that school uh, that lives into the different areas. So it means that if you are uh, working in a school where 90% of your, your students live in a, in a red area, let's say the furthest area, or not the furthest in, in geography necessarily, but in time to get to school, you might have different uh, policies for school location, transportation, um, and then, and then, then if the majority of your students live, live let's say, in a, in a green area, so those who take less time to get to school. But let me uh, share the floor with uh, Topi, who will get into the more technical details of the tool. Yeah, sure. Thank, thank you very much, Amelie, and, and hello, everyone, uh, from my side. Really, really happy to be here. 
really happy to talk about our our work that we've been doing uh, doing with uh, IIEP uh, lately. Uh, and firstly, now about uh, now about isochrones. Um, so the discussion uh, started uh, with with the idea that uh, currently, uh, quite often when evaluating the accessibility to schools, um, straight line buffers are used, uh, and and that that basically means that you you take a distance from school let it be five kilometers or, or so and then evaluate how many how many people or, or school age uh, children live inside that area but as as we can can imagine that that's not not the uh, real life case because uh, geographies geographies vary uh, accessibility varies so uh, a better way to describe accessibility are isochrones and isochrones basically mean areas which uh, have same time uh, within within a, a polygon feature. That, that means that uh, in a, in an image, you can you can see there on on top the image uh, with with white white points uh, as schools, and then um, uh, blue areas as thirty minutes accessibility and and so forth. Uh, isochrones can be generated technically with uh, various different tools. Uh, as Amelie mentioned, we were focusing on on, on open source tools um, because of the accessibility of, of, of the tools so that it would be easier to access them and, and to use them. Uh, there are multiple different use uh, tools that can do uh, multiple different uh, open source packages that can do technically isochrones. Um, for example, o OSRM, BG routing, um, Valhalla routing, but uh, we decided to use for this purpose uh, a tool called Graph Hopper, uh, which is an open source Java based package uh, that can do different sorts of routing, uh, solve different sorts of routing problems, including uh, creating isochrones. Uh, basically, the process needs two main components of data it needs school locations and a road network. And the better the road network, uh, better the quality of the data, uh, the more re reliable the results and more more useful the results. Uh, and many of the open source tools are using uh, out of the box uh, open street data, uh, and and so so is uh, GraphHopper. They can be used also with with other data sources, but uh, open street is the de facto, um, and and that was used to create the isochrones with the. Uh, commonly agreed uh, parameters, and then uh, the isochrones were created. I can show you uh, in in a second uh, a demo notebook. And when they were created, they were taken to QGIS, and then on the QGIS side, uh, they were combined with with population uh, and evaluated how how many people live in each uh, each feature. But uh, I I could show you uh, quickly the That's notebook. Yeah. Yes. No, I'll, I'll close my screen so that you can share yours. And while you set up, uh, let me just acknowledge that we're working with real life data uh, from uh, from Jamaica. So our colleague Melissa, who is online, uh, we, we work together uh, iteratively so that we can uh, discuss the usefulness and the, um, the different uh, tweaks that we can make to the tool to, to make it more relevant for planners. Yes, and it was super helpful to use uh, use a real life case, uh, and 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 I must say that the OpenStreetMap data quality in in Jamaica was really good, and because Jamaica is an island, it was a really let's say geographically um, interesting uh, and suitable suitable test case for this. Um, but we have created a uh, a short and simple Jupyter notebook. So basically, Jupyter notebooks are interactive uh, Python in environments. So, so the programming language is Python, uh, and then you can in in include uh, code, and then you can include comments there. So, and then you can modify modify the contents. Uh, actually, creating creating the uh, uh, Isochrones is relatively simple from a technical perspective, but the idea is that with, with the Jupyter Notebook, it's easy to see what happens, how you can set it up, and how you can modify the results. Uh, our notebook includes instructions on how to set up uh, GraphHopper, uh, Graph how to install it. I have it now running on my, on my local machine, 
I'm using a Windows machine, but I'm using Linux inside of it. And uh, and you you can just download the the package and and run it based based on these instructions. Uh, the notebook includes information on how to download uh, OpenStreetMap extracts for specific countries, uh, and then you set up the routing engine and run it. Um, I'll just run these few uh, cells in my notebook. The idea is that you these are uh, code cells which you can run inside the notebook, and the other ones are comments. So there, I imported some Python packages, and this is the part where most of the things happen. So here I set up, for example, um, what is the starting point coordinates, what's the travel time, vehicle type, and so forth. We are using hike to include all types of movement by foot uh, towards the target. But now I'll, I'll run this one, and then I'll run the last cell for to show you actually how the isochron is created. So this creates me uh, a simple uh, isochron with uh, four polygon features, uh, 30 minutes, 60, 90, and 120 minutes accessibility. And, and we're now assuming that there would be a school in, in this central location. Uh, the notebook also includes uh, a longer uh, uh, section or, or, or a different version of the same thing if you have a, have a lot of school locations and you would like to run them all at once, which is probably the case, unless you want to do it for one, one single school. And then on, on QGIS side, you have it. Uh, once you run, run, run all, all of the school locations, you can, you can import the data in, in a GeoJSON format to QGIS and uh, continue the analysis there. Uh, that's in, in, in a very short manner. And, and later on in the Q&A session, if someone has uh, uh, any, any type of questions, not, not only good questions, but any type of questions, <laughs> interesting questions and, or comments, uh, would be really ha happy to hear. Thanks for this. So we'll take it back from there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is a, a really interesting, I mean, of course, I'm going to say it's a very interesting tool, but I think it really can, help us rethink the way we address supply um, uh, and planning of infrastructure and, and different topics like this. So uh, thanks for P for, thanks to P for this uh, deeper dive. Now, moving, I, I guess, following on the uh, topic of um, infrastructure and educational facilities, uh, one of the um, topic that we wanted to explore also and that we, we explore with, with UNOSAT is this idea that natural events, uh, Context uh, in the in the landscape uh, might affect the durability of the infrastructure and might call for either uh, refurbishing, relocating uh, existing school, but also uh, we need to anticipate as planners where would be the best location to put school. Of course, taking into account the population, the demand for for education, but when we have an idea of where education is in demand to create new school, where, how can we know where it's best to locate? And so please let me uh, give the floor to Aisha Sheldon from UNOSAT so that we can uh, hear a bit more about our, our collaboration. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here and to share um, our work that we've been doing from UNOSAT side with IAP. I think it's quite exciting and in line with a lot of other topics that we've already mentioned today. Um, so first of all, uh, just to introduce, um, we created two geospatial um, different models um, and different, um, different tools that can be used to help in different aspects of education planning. Um, the first was the geospatial risk assessment um, for existing schools. So this looked at um, the different risk for existing education facilities and schools within an area. Um, with this, we actually did a live case study on actually a province on the Sumatra Island in Indonesia, um, which you can see on the screen. And um, we looked at this area um, and looked at the different risks and hazards um, and 
it's quite prevalent natural hazard risk. So this was one of the main risks that we focused on, or the main kind of hazards, sorry, when we were running uh, this study. So uh, the first step was to create the customised hazard index, and this was based off other known international indexes, um, such as the INFORM index, just to take a section of it to focus on. Um, and we looked at specific natural hazards within the region. So we specifically looked at earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, severe weather, events, landslides and volcanoes. And we're actually lucky to leverage the Indonesian Inner Risk Data Portal to obtain some of their hazard um, data from that portal, which is an open source um, data portal that had quite a lot of really good uh, data that we could use. Um, so with these hazard layers, we were able to combine them to create the um, hazard index, which can be seen in the top image. Um, that was the output there, which can show the hazard index level. Um, and then the next step of this was to then combine that hazard index with the school and the education facilities in the region. So this uh, data on the school points and location was also obtained from open source um, uh, open source data as well, and we combined the hazard index um, to those schools, and then each school was a, was assigned a um, index from zero to one or zero to ten uh, to then kind of identify where the schools were that were most at risk. Um, so the first part of the model was just basically to identify those at risk schools or education facilities, and then um, we took that one step further in the second model, the second part of the collaboration. So, yeah, the second part was the creation of the multi-criteria decision analysis tool for the land suitability. And as Emily said, this was for either the relocation of schools in hazardous areas or for building new schools. And this was based off the geospatial suitability analysis where you use different, um, a selected and customizable criteria uh, to create a suitability model. Um, for this case study, we selected three main categories, which were environment and hazard risk, infrastructure and economic risk, and social risk. And under these three categories, we chose two to three different indicators um, to create the uh, land suitability um, model. So we actually used the output of the first part, the um, hazard index, as one of the criteria for the environment and hazard risk category. Um, so there's quite a few categories um, I can go through. So we used the um, hazard index. So for environment and hazard risk, we used the hazard index from the first part, the slope risk, um, the vegetation distribution to minimise tree and forest disruption. And then under infrastructure and economic risk, we looked at main road proximity, river and flash flooding risks. And then under social, we looked at population density and existing uh, education infrastructure and facilities. So when we combined these, we uh, allocated a suitability score between one and four to each of the geospatial layers, and then we're able to combine them based on category and then also all together to create the final output layer. And with this model, it's really customizable and you're able to swap in and out different uh, data layers and different um, criteria depending on the context and what you want to model, and also to um, assign like a weighted criteria as well. So this is really um, important, especially when looking at different sites as some things may be more important than others, uh, depending on um, if you're building a new school or relocating another school or um, I guess the purpose of uh, what you're trying to map at the time. Um, so I guess this output you can see in the top is the overall province, um, the whole province. So it's also quite a good study because we ran it at the province provincial level, but you're also able to zoom in. So the second image shows um, kind of very zoomed in version of a specific area. And this was the Bund Akshay region, which is the main um, city in, in the province. Um, so these are the two models that we uh, created and joined together to use the geospatial data for education planning context. I think that they provide quite a good output um, and can be really helpful depending on um, which area and which region you're looking at. I guess um, they're quite dependent on the input data, um, so it's necessary to try and find 
the right data or have enough data to run the models. Otherwise, um, the output might lack some context. Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, and, and, and one point that you made, Aisha, also is that, well, that's the kind of one of the strengths of geospatial analysis is that you can scroll scroll out, let's say zoom out and have a like a national view or provincial view, but you can you can zoom in and have like a, a sub-regional, sub-national, uh, even city level or even school level assessment and evaluation and analysis. And so that 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 shows that, that kind of tool shows the richness of uh, of using geospatial analysis. Um, and as you mentioned, also, I wanted to point out that uh, we were absolutely uh, amazed by the uh, quality and availability and, uh, let's say, uh, uh, freedom of access uh, to this, uh, these national uh, sources of information. Uh, going back to, to what Jack asked earlier on population, this is the same thing here, right? Any, any country can use their own uh, nationally produced uh, risk assessment uh, data. Uh, georeference data. Uh, we can use uh, other data sets that are produced by different agencies. One, one source that we use a lot is the Humanitarian Data Exchange. So the HDX plat platform, they, they, there's a lot of information put together out there. It's, uh, uh, it's like a warehouse of uh, different uh, data sets. Um, and as uh, Ian is asking on, on, on the Q&A, and I kind of jump on, on the opportunity to, to add it here, um, the focus for, well, this is this is work in progress, right? So the the focus right now is on natural and environment uh, risks, uh, but indeed the we just we discussed that with Aisha just uh, this morning that uh, a kind of extension or a next step would be to also take into account geopolitical hazards, uh, conflicts, uh, security, uh, and so forth. Um, so so yes, I guess that could be an extension um, for uh, the work that related to uh, this placement or the existence of camps or security levels or um, civil uh, unrest, uh, we tend to, to use more the geographically weighted regression models that Haman presented a bit earlier. Uh, but I guess this one could be adapted to uh, without uh, too much problem. Thank you so much, Aisha, for your uh, inputs. Thank you. Now, if we move to the third uh, project that uh, we really like uh, this is this is on optimizing inspection routes and so this is if you look at the inspection related literature uh, if there's such a genre uh, resources uh, put to, to at the disposal of inspectors to to travel to schools and re, uh, the access to these schools by the road or by the different means of transportation are always mentioned in inspection related work. It's always mentioned as a, a reason for not being able to visit every school at the frequency they should. It's always uh, mentioned as a, 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 an explanation of the, the hardship of uh, the work of inspectors around the world. And so at the base of this work, we, we thought, what if we could design the optimal inspection system, right? Design it from scratch and see what what it would look like if we were only basing ourselves on geospatial data, on uh, route uh, accessibility, and, and trying to draw the most optimized inspection routes. Like It's like deliver robot for inspection. Of course, we know that uh, inspection uh, are, uh, are bounded by administrative rules, political um, economies, uh, and so we know that this is a bit uh, a fictional project, but we, we're very curious to see what, what it would look like if we were building the, the most optimized uh, inspection system. And so we're working on this also with uh, Gizmo. So, so I will just move on to, to Topi so that you can uh, go into the, the details of this one. Yeah. Hi, it's me again. Uh, so this also was, was a really interesting interesting thing to look into. Uh, and, and and this was something. If I compare this to the to the isochrone uh, issue, this was this was a very different uh, from our, our perspective. Because, like Amelie mentioned, we we look at things from from a purely te technical aspect. And 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 Amelie and Haman has uh, have acted acted as the subject matter experts. So so when when we discussed about this and and looked into this problem of uh, optimizing inspection routes. Uh, we realized uh, very quickly that it's an extremely complex problem to solve. If we look at look look at it from a from a 
geospatial point of view. Uh, if we think about it from a geospatial point of view, it includes multiple different problems in itself. Uh, and, and what is actually the problem depends on uh, from which perspective are you looking at, at it from. Are you looking at it from a, from an individual inspector point of view? Are you the inspector uh, who has already um, fixed schools that he or she has to visit? And that's the route that you're optimizing. Or is it so that you have a, a set of schools and you have to optimize your routes uh, between those? Is it is it like routing from A to B? Uh, do you have multiple destinations? Uh, are you moving between those destinations? Um, and, and of course, the time span, how long are you spending in one school? That, that varies a lot uh, between inspect and inspection processes. As, as we, we learn to know, uh, it, it can be either a really brief visit of just, uh, just a few hours or, or then, a, then a longer process that takes a day or even several days. Uh, or then another point of view that it, it can be looked at from, uh, if you're looking at, at it from a geospatial aspect, is that if if you're, an, let's say, a person working in, in a higher level in, in, in the administration, doing the division of work uh, between the inspectors, inspectors uh, that's, again, another type of problem. That's called a location allocation problem. Uh, and then, then if you have multiple inspectors um, and you have to think of how they will move, uh, that's typically called a vehicle routing problem. Of course, inspectors are not vehicles, but they are uh, moving with with one vehicle or, or another. And and there are different uh, different tool different tools and different methods that um, apply that, that can be applied uh, to solve the problem. And and the approach that we took was that we we looked into these different tools and and and, and tried to figure out the process on which tool and which algorithm can help with e each of these questions. And and another thing uh, that that is there in the slides that I have to mention is the um, multimodal routing uh, issue because. Um, if we think of routing uh, in general, uh, quite often we're, uh, from a technical point of view, we're thinking it with a car or by foot. Uh, but with, if we're thinking this as a, as a global problem, uh, or not a global problem, but um, a thing to be solved, uh, the, the, we learned also it, with our discussions that the uh, vehicle can be uh, uh, public transport uh, by foot, by by car, by by whatever, and then all the geos uh, geospatial experts on the call think that understand that it becomes extremely complex when you have uh, multiple different vehicles in, included in the in the mix. But what? But we ended up uh, looking into the problem from. Um, from a clustering aspect, uh, and and with distances rather than using uh, road distances here, we're using Euclidean distances to give some kind of an aspect how how the work could be divided. And the screenshot you see there is from from Myanmar, which we used as a as a, as a case study here, um, and we used uh, quite, a lot, quite a lot of assumptions on on how this could work, but. Uh, at the same time, that kind of approach can then help to apply it elsewhere. Uh, but what we did, did there, what you see in the picture, is that uh, we had school locations, uh, and, and with QGIS, we, we mapped out a process where we had, had, had school locations and then uh, township locations. And we assumed that the inspectors would be located in these townships. And then, then we looked at how, how the work could be divided uh, if we divide the schools uh, based to, to clusters uh, based on their their closest township, and 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 quite interestingly, it uh, quite a lot of the movement happens over the administrative boundaries, which it, then in real life probably is not the case. Uh, but but with QGIS, uh, with it uh, with looked at the closest closest hubs uh, from each school and then 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 did clustering and then mapped out uh, what could be the the optimal route 
but uh, rather than having a one single like um, line of code that optimizes the routes between schools, this is uh, uh, this process was more like a looking into the whole complexity of the issue and uh, what geospatial tools can be helpful with what aspects of the problem. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and as you mentioned, you know, this uh, looking at the boundaries and how. Sometimes an office is closer to a school than, than another from an administrative boundary. This is interesting because it also puts in question, you know, collaboration, uh, sharing the work uh, at different administrative levels. And so it, it brings a different set of questions that go a, a lot beyond, I would say, geospatial analysis and even uh, inspection services. Um, but but uh, uh, now, now we're working with the inspection because literature is very clear on the topic and on the role of travel for making inspection um, efficient, uh, but also thinking about you know the whole theory of change is that if you have more inspection, quality of education remains good or improves. And so uh, this is why we focus on this. But uh, indeed, uh, there, there are different applications for this. If you work at a central office uh, and, and that you have a team that is mandated to uh, to bring uh, either paychecks or uh, survey, school census survey uh, questionnaires, uh, you could definitely organize your route like this. But I, I think there, there are several applications for this. And I would even think uh, to conclude on, on this topic that even at the individual inspector level, this could be interesting. I was uh, uh, doing an interview with a, uh, a French inspector a few a few uh, weeks ago, and he was telling me that when he got transferred to a new area, he worked with colleagues so that he could um, he could uh, say, uh, get allocated the schools that could be accessible in, in public transportation because he, he couldn't drive. And so at his personal level, he could actually perhaps use this kind of optimization to see over his territory uh, how he could, you know, uh, make the, the travel more efficient. So I, I guess we can continue to explore on this topic and, and see how we can make it useful to, to different people uh, for different purposes. Thanks, Topi, for your inputs. Thank you. Now, the, probably the last uh, topic I wanted to uh, to put on the agenda was to give some, some feedback uh, on our recent hackathon. Uh, it was a, an incredible experience, and we have uh, in the attendance uh, a few people that participated. So it was the last weekend of January uh, during 48 hours. So from Friday evening to Sunday evening, we had more than 100 people around the world from four continents uh, that joined us for, for coding, designing, uh, working on UX, on different topics, to, to, respond, to, to respond to six challenges that uh, IIP uh, had uh, designed for them. And so uh, it was very interesting because we could have uh, colleagues from uh, all IIP offices, so in, in Paris, Dakar, and Buenos Aires, that contributed to the challenges. And uh, we worked collaboratively uh, over the clock uh, during a, a whole weekend to, uh, to design solution. Now, I won't go too much into the, de the details of what were the challenges and what were the products that were, were proposed at the end. Uh, we have a nice web news that we, uh, we will paste uh, in the, the chat box so that you can read a summary of the event. But this, is, this will give you also an idea of, of the topics that we are interested to, to develop over uh, 2021. So uh, continuing to focus and publish and, and test and pilot uh, all you've seen uh, today, uh, but also getting into uh, different other you know, prototypes to see how we can um, uh, find an algorithm that uses natural language processing to match records and, and try to identify ghost teachers. For example, we are uh, thinking about working on a, a plugin to uh, create these population estimates at the very local level using World Pop estimates or national estimates. Uh, we are also exploring dashboards, so to to you know facilitate the the analysis and the use of uh, learning assessment data and teacher teaching workforce um, staff to to make more efficient uh, deployment allocation uh, decisions. And the last one, the one that you see at the bottom uh, right, is uh, another one that we, uh, we, we cherish a lot. Uh, it's a, it's a, a whole idea that uh, we can use natural language processing, topic modeling, deep learning to analyze large amounts of inspection reports and map them that back to, to the country to see if they are uh, issues in, identified by the inspection reports that are more clustered in certain geographic areas. Um, so as you can see, you know, all the work that we do is based on, um, on 
freely accessible and accessible uh, uh, free of charge uh, open source software. Uh, we want everything to be accessible and replicable by anyone. And so everything that comes out of the team is uh, code and documentation to be replicated. And so what, uh, what the, the future basically uh, is very rich if we, uh, if we see just has how the past has been uh, so far. So as, as Sue, Susan, uh, our director mentioned the opening statement, uh, we, we, re we would really love uh, to engage more with you um, and try to see if we can pilot one of these tools in your programs, in your context, in your district, country, uh, or uh, any other administration. Uh, if you uh, are a, a philanthropist, you can support uh, financially uh, the, the development of tools and plugins or different methodologies. But in any case, uh, please connect with us, stay connected. Uh, you can reach us uh, through this email that you have online. And you can also uh, reach out on Twitter. So you, you have here the, the, three, uh, the three main accounts that, uh, that we consult every day. Um, the, 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 I would say the floor is yours now. We can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I am sure that Camilla uh, will be able to, to pass on the microphone if you want to take uh, the floor. Uh, but we would be really interested to listening to, to what you think, what are your thoughts, what are your experiences, and how we can you know, continue to exchange on these, uh, on these topics. Thanks a lot. So, uh, Eric, I see that you have your, your hand raised. Is, is this um, a signal that you would like to, uh, to have uh, to, to put a question um, on the chat, perhaps? Or if Camilla, you can give him the, the mic so that he can uh, uh, take uh, the floor. Yes, uh, I see from the chat that we are curious to see what uh, is happening with the, the tools from the hackathon. Yeah, definitely. We, I can give you more detail right now. So we are engaging with all participants uh, of the hackathon. Some of the team did not present the project at the end of the hackathon. So just as a reminder, a hackathon is a, a 48 hours of immersive coding and uh, computer uh, computing sessions. Um, and so it's possible that at the end, the different teams that are involved are not presenting a, 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 a prototype, uh, but all the IIT staff that were uh, engaged in, in preparing a challenge are now getting in touch with the different uh, participants so that we can go in more details in, um, in, in what they are proposing and see if we can collaborate further to uh, see these tools becoming uh, a reality and actually be part of the, the IIT offer. Thank you for the compliments. Mm -mm. Uh, Haman, do you have any questions in the Q&A that we could answer? Yes, uh, we have one from G. Mont. Uh, which says, pensez-vous que cette méthodologie et l'ensemble de ces instruments techniquement séduisants uh, soient directement applicables et opérationnels dans les pays sahariens, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Tchad, Mauritanie, comme dans certains pays d'Afrique centrale, RCA, et qui, de ces faits, ont le plus grand besoin d'outils de planification spatiale. Avez-vous conscience de l'énorme gap entre cette approche et la réalité sur le terrain En d'autres termes, comment passer de PowerPoint au terrain Ah ah, j'adore. C'est Professeur Mantes, merci pour votre question. If you are not fluent in French, please go to the bottom of your screen to take, check the interpretation uh, to, to English. And so let me continue into French. Euh, C'est une très, très bonne question, euh, Monsieur Montes. Euh, effectivement, euh, avec certains pays, on est en discussion en ce moment, avec certains même pays que, que vous avez euh, euh, nommés, on est en discussion pour voir comment est-ce qu'on pourrait soutenir le ministère à créer une première cartographie géoréférencée des écoles. Euh, effectivement, la, la, le, afin de tirer profit 
euh, des, du potentiel des données géospatiales, il faut effectivement avoir une certaine base de statistiques éducatives disponibles. Euh, C'est un défi pour beaucoup de pays, particulièrement ceux que vous avez mentionnés. On est en, en ce moment en train de mener un, un projet de coopération technique avec un pays justement pour lequel c'est un peu le défi de, de pouvoir mettre ensemble toutes les données euh, statistiques collectées euh, et pas nécessairement euh, euh, avec une couverture euh, euh, optimale. Euh, mais effectivement, en fait, ce que vous notez, c'est un, un fait pour lequel on est tout à fait euh, au courant et qu'on essaie justement de pouvoir aller pas à pas avec euh, avec euh, les, les ministères, euh, la plupart des outils qu'on qu développe peuvent être utilisés euh, de manière euh, séquentielle ou progressive. C'est-à-dire que, par exemple, euh, certains des outils, effectivement, se basent sur la localisation des écoles. Donc, sans cette localisation des écoles, c'est effectivement difficile de pouvoir euh, utiliser, par exemple, l'outil sur les... les euh, aires de recrutement. Par contre, d'autres outils, comme par exemple les régressions basées sur, euh, pondérées par euh, la géographie, euh, dans ce cas-là, c'est euh, effectivement possible d'utiliser des données euh, géoréférencées au niveau district, donc euh, à un niveau plus élevé que le niveau école, qui est en fait un système de coordonnées. Mais donc, avec des données un peu agrégées, on peut arriver à, à, à avoir des, euh, des, des pistes de réflexion. Vous me donnez l'occasion de rajouter un, un point très, très important, peut-être que j'aurais dû mentionner dès le départ, c'est que tous les outils qu'on propose euh, contribuent à informer la prise de décision, mais ne remplacent pas aucune autre source euh, d'évidence ou de preuve, euh, dans le sens où euh, les, ce qu'on appelle l'évidence, en tout cas les preuves, les, les garanties de succès, euh, d'une part, euh, peut-être qu'elles n'existent pas, et sinon elles sont multiples. Et donc, euh, nos outils, en fait, euh, nous mènent à des pistes euh, de réflexion et, et d'analyse plutôt qu'à des solutions directes. Et donc, avec cette mise en garde, on peut peut-être euh, se dire qu'effectivement, euh, l'idée, c'est de, de soutenir les pays euh, s'ils sont euh, prêts à mettre en œuvre ces, ces méthodologies, mais en tout cas, de prendre, euh, de prendre les résultats pour, euh, comme, comme, comme supplément d'information plutôt que vérité absolue. Merci. Um, from the chat, I see so many things. It's really nice to engage. I think we, wish, we should actually put this uh, all together. But uh, I see one comment on the road uh, data. It, it, it can be indeed a challenge. Um, if I can pick up on, on the example of uh, Jamaica, I think with uh, Topi, we were extremely, uh, extremely satisfied with the, the quality of the road network uh, data that uh, could be used for, for Jamaica, for the catchment area uh, isochron work. Uh, but what is really interesting, uh, as I mentioned just in French a minute ago, what is interesting with these tools is that it, they're not meant to give you the truth and to say, oh, this is the solution, but rather to say, okay, look, this is what geospatial data can inform and help to, to kind of follow some, some needs. And with the the, um, the catchment area work that we did with, uh, with Melissa McTavish that is, uh, is online also, was to say, okay, all these tools can be, can be uh, mapped Uh, and we can calculate isochrons around them, except I think a total of two schools could not be connected to the, the rural network. So if you if you tell this to me as a data scientist, I will say, oh, we, we have to organize a mapathon in Jamaica to be able to map the, the rural network around these schools. But as a planner, my reaction would rather be to say, okay, let's organize a visit to these schools to see how actually uh, how students get to that school, to see if there is an issue of getting to that school. Perhaps it's also just a coordinate error, uh, but we, we, we have different responses from the side uh, uh, on which we, we are taking the information in. Uh, so yes, indeed, in, in context where um, uh, road data would uh, not be as good as in Jamaica, it might create a challenge. Um, I see Michael X. Ezri that is talking about ArcGIS uh, on the chat. Um, but the whole idea, yes, is, is that uh, we, we work with information that is available. And if we can use Earth observation or other methods to estimate uh, the time to walk to school, for example, this would be uh, interesting to explore at least. Uh, Topi, do you want to react? Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, if I can, can complement uh, yes, uh, on, on that, um, there, there was also a question on. Simple question on what was the road data used in, in the work, uh, 
process. So it was called OpenStreetMap. And OpenStreetMap, if, if people are not aware of OpenStreetMap in general, it's usually referred to as the Wikipedia of maps. So it's a, it's a huge global data set that anyone can edit and anyone can use. And, and so that, that was the one that was used uh used here yeah people love always them in the chat and uh yeah it was great and and like i mentioned quite many of the open source tools work with osm data uh, out of the box and and if there's like like amelie mentioned if there's a, a clear uh, let's say a gap uh in in the data the the greatest point of osm is that anyone can edit and improve the data mm -hmm. yeah absolutely herman from the q a side do you have any inputs Questions or comments? Um, I'm doing my best to respond to um, particular questions. For instance, right now I'm asked, I'm answering because someone is asking if there are a lot of mobile temporary schools, are there any implications for using GIS tools? Hmm. That's a very interesting. Uh, and so what I was saying is that of course this poses a challenge, but it's in itself a great opportunity because the, the very fact that you have mobile and temporary schools means that first you need to be very aware of the movement of these uh, different uh, resources because they're ultimately resources, but it also means that with the proper GIS infrastructure, uh, for instance, knowing where the population is and creating catchment areas, you have a much easier response capability to uh, supply education to people that are currently underserviced, for mm. instance. So indeed, we can use different tools together to quickly respond or detect needs within the educational system so that we can act more rapidly to solve them. But just this, this idea of uh, looking at the, the, the pathway of the mobile school, this is uh, super interesting. Um, I see a comment by Elias Acuna from uh, Brazil. Um, I, I, you would like to know if there are any regulations, rules, or advice from UNESCO to country member states uh, about the use of a georeferencing tool on the education system for better planning. This is an excellent question. This is something we're trying to tackle right now because we understand that geospatial information and, and georeference information is very rich, uh, but also when you work with potentially vulnerable populations, uh, this might uh, create some risks also for, for privacy, for security, for confidentiality. And so we are exploring right now the, the ethics of uh, using geospatial information for educational planning with uh, Lily that I introduced at the beginning. But I would really love to, to get in touch with any one of you that is working on the topic or has uh, references on the topic. Uh, this is something that is uh, uh, super important uh, to us. Um, and that is uh, absolutely relevant, especially because we we just looking at how this type of information has been main, made accessible and available uh, over the last uh, 10 years, uh, we can just expect that it's going to, to go forward. And so uh, we have to keep in mind these, um, uh, these ethical issues. So please connect with us if you have any leads on how to address this uh, topic. Um, yes. Thank you, Haman, for putting the emails in the chat box. How um, Chacon is- We have- uh, Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, we have another question, which is how can we adapt the planning tools from the hackathon to the respective contexts? Yeah. Uh, these are open source, but do we need any essential computing coding skill, computer coding skills to mm. do that? Well, the, the hackathon uh, results are, are prototypes right now. So we worked, for example, with uh, inspection reports from, from Ireland. Uh, from uh, uh, I mean, we, we created also uh, mock countries uh, just for the sake of, of estimating. We work with Burundi Open Data. Um, all the tools that we design are made to be fully customizable to any context. So in a sense, of course, if you if you work for one specific country, you will have extra customization, but this will be available only for that single country. What we're trying to do is to find kind of the the optimal uh, how do you say like the the optimal point between uh, a, a certain level of generalization, but again a, a certain level of specificity so that the the results can be uh, extremely useful. 
for the for any context. But of course, all these tools can be modified and and improved in um, in precision for addressing any context. So the the goal is that uh, either uh, Agaton byproduct or uh, all the tools and methodologies that we presented today. The idea is that uh, they can be customized to uh, to any context. Um, yes. So uh, if you're an educational planner that you don't have uh, real experience or uh, training in, in using uh, geospatial information. We uh, we have prepared a few uh, a few trainings, uh, part of our formal and informal offer, to to get acquainted with uh, a free open source software that is QGIS. Um, but of course, if you go online on YouTube on different learning platform, you will find several. Trainings that go, that go in depth and that go uh, in areas broader than educational planning. So, uh, so you can train yourself relatively easily. And if you use uh, free open source software, these training materials will will often be also for for free. Um, yes, Haman, if you could paste uh, in the chat box the link to the web news on the hackathon results. Right away. Thank you so much. So, Juan, you will get the the answer to your question. Um, we also have a question from Tami. Uh, Benaj, okay. ask any plans to use GIA to, GIS tools for SDG4 indicators? That's a great question. Yes, absolutely. And there's also a group uh, that works on Earth observation for SDGs. Um, I mean, the whole point of SDG4 is providing efficient, quality, e e uh, equitable uh, education opportunities to, to everyone. So in that sense, what we showed you today uh, focus uh, a lot on um, Let's say the youth, so from uh, from early childhood to to end of secondary uh, mm -hmm. education. Oh, Eric, please mute yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but actually, once once you have the technique, you can apply it to 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 anything. So you can look at uh, higher education. One of the uh, Ish area that we're very interested in is the teachers, so teacher allocation, teacher training, and so we're trying to also uh, engage in these areas with uh, geospatial tools. Um, so, so yeah, I guess uh, everything we do by de facto by IIP's mission is towards SDG4. So uh, perhaps that's a that's a general answer to your your question. Um, I, I see a, a comment by uh, Raul, who's working uh, with the KICS, so the Knowledge and Innovation Exchange in Central America and Caribbean. Uh, yes, get in touch, Raul. We can see how we can uh, work together. Um, actually, we were in touch with colleagues from the KICS uh, in East Asia and Pacific, uh, Europe uh, and, and the Pacific. And so uh, we would be happy to, to discuss with you how to collaborate. Uh Yes. I have a question from uh, Armel um, qui demande J'ai pas bien saisi la relation entre les pixels et la tranche et les tranches d'âge. Mm -hmm. uh, alors, comment ça fonctionne C'est que uh, World Pop, uh, qui est un, un organisme uh, basé à l'université de Southampton, uh, publie des, ça qu'on appelle raster. Les raster, c'est des images géoréférencié normalement ici d'un pays qui montre euh, pour chaque pixel combien de personnes qui habitent dans cette ubication là euh, ont un âge donc euh, ça veut dire qu'on a euh, un raster pour les femmes entre 0 et 4 ans un raster pour les femmes entre 5 et 9 ans et, euh, et ensuite, et ensuite. Euh, le problème, c'est que normalement, si on travaille avec des, des groupes d'âge entre 5 et 9, entre 10 et 14, entre 20 et, et 24, euh, ça ne va pas euh, être les mêmes groupes que euh, les groupes d'âge de, de la primaire. Parce que normalement, ça peut être entre 600 et 13 ans, ou 600 et 1400. Donc, on ne peut pas utiliser ce type de données pour faire des calculs du système éducatif. La méthodologie de Sprague, ce qu'il fait, c'est euh, un peu avoir cette euh, groupe des 4 ans, des 5 ans d'âge, il est coupé 
dans des années, dans des années singuliers. Comme ça, on aura pour les groupes de 0 à 4, on aura l'information pour 0, pour 1, pour 2, 3 et 4. Et comme ça, si on a tous les âges par année singulière, on pourra reconstruire les groupes d'âge par rapport au système éducatif du pays dans lequel on travaille. Donc, c'est pour ça que les pixels, c'est juste une mesure de combien de personnes avec sept groupes d'âge habitent dans une location spécifique. Et ensuite, ce qu'on fait, c'est qu'on compte pour chaque division administrative combien de personnes habitent par rapport au nombre de pixels et aux valeurs de chaque pixel dans cette division administrative. Et après, on applique les méthodologies, les méthodologies de Sprague pour diviser les années dans des années singulières. Et après, on fait la reconstruction de cette euh, euh, groupe d'âge qui correspond à la primaire ou à la secondaire ou ensuite. Voilà. Il y a peut-être ajouté simplement que la façon dont ces pixels euh, sont créés, c'est avec les données satellites pour estimer la densité de la population sur le territoire. Donc C'est un peu un, un, un exercice de gymnastique, mais c'est utile pour pouvoir anticiper euh, les, la demande en éducation. Uh, we also have a question from Sarwat Alam. Was we want to find out of school children uh, who are they and where they are located? Mm. Is there any way to find that efficiently through GIS mapping and tools? There is, and it's perhaps the easiest way to do it. So <laughs> basically, uh, well, there is Paribus, eh? <laughs> yeah, it, it has a, an asterisk, of course, uh, because all methodologies must have their asterisks. But basically, what we can do is using this Sprague methodology um, that we just described. What we can do is we can make estimations as for the number of children of any um, age group. So reconstructed primary age groups, for instance, for any administrative boundary. And so that way, if you have uh, an idea of how many students you have registered under the EMIS, under the Education Management and Information System, and you have an estimation of how many students of that same age group you have for each administrative unit, then you just need to subtract uh, one from the other and then you get the out of school children estimation. Of course, uh, this means that we can only obtain as to who they are, we can only obtain their administrative uh, unit, so where they live and whether they are boys or girls, but we cannot get from this data at least any further information as to um, the educational level of their parents or whether they live in uh, a single home or a shared home or any other socioeconomic variable, but at least we can have a quick um, way of estimating for each region or for each district or for each village how many people are out of school for each uh, for each age and for each uh, sex. But, uh, Sawat, let me put you in touch with a Pakistani researcher who made a proposal like uh, around these, these areas uh, earlier, um, a few months ago. Um, that's gonna, I see that we are already ran out of time. Uh, there are a lot of uh, discussions still uh, coming in. Um, perhaps let's, let's just close on two last comments. First, one from uh, Melissa Lunan Maktavish from Jamaica. Uh, that is currently using a COVID-19 data and maps for advising the phased reopening of schools. Uh, we have not used GWR for COVID-19, but I think this would be really interesting. The challenge with COVID-19 uh, data is that, uh, I, 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 well, I mean, to our knowledge, there's not a lot of uh, uh, government that put this uh, this data, uh, this geo-reference data uh, publicly available. So on our side for exploration, we couldn't, um, use that. I, I, I know only about the government of Ontario in Canada that is um, uh, providing such, such information that is um, uh, put on, on maps, Joe, Joe uh, um, referenced by uh, Prachi Srivastava in, in Canada. Uh, but actually get in touch with us. We would love to, to see if we can uh, support you, if you need any support uh, to do this. But it would be interesting to, to look at the results. Last question, maybe I see that uh, Juliette Doris Messina Onana has the hand raised. Um, I don't know, Camila, if you can give the floor to uh, Juliette Messina. 
Uh, I have yeah. allowed her to yeah. to speak. So, so if Juliet? you unmute yourself, Juliet, you should be able. Um, okay, so, bon, allez-y, allez-y, Juliette. Hop, oh, maybe not. Okay, well, um, perhaps it's time to close. I see that the PIC uh, has shared the UN Secretary General Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, and, and this is a very useful document if you want to take a look uh, also to see how the UN envisages this, uh, this whole uh, field. Um, perhaps it's time to uh, to close. I, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of the whole development. Si au nom de l'unité de développement et au nom uh, de l'IPE et mes amis de UNESCO vont me rejoindre. Donc nous avons eu 135 personnes. And I hope we can get in touch uh, and continue to collaborate and exchange ideas. So thanks everyone. Uh, and see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Uh, feel free to contact us to development at iap.unesco.org uh, or at any of our emails, which I have added into the chat here. Yeah. Let me project uh, the, the screen with uh, our email and uh, Twitter handle. Perfect. Thanks for joining, everyone.